a shame nobody likes each other. Good morning, everybody. Let's try that again. Good morning, everybody. Before we get started with our greeting, I want to read a verse that's very close to my heart, and I know it's close to the heart of the leaders of this church. It's Acts 2.42. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And I want to welcome you this morning by saying that as a church, we are devoted to the apostles' teaching. And they taught Jesus Christ, the gospel, through the scriptures. We're devoted to that. And as you can see, we're devoted to the fellowship. Anytime the church can gather, whether it's here corporately, within one another's homes, one-on-one, whatever it may be, we're devoted to becoming the family of God that we're called to be, the members of the body of Christ, to the breaking of bread. We're devoted every single Sunday to meeting around the Lord's table, but not only that, to do what Jesus did, supping together. Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice, And opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Jesus did a lot of good around a supper table. And we're devoted to to being with one another and building that bond. And also to the prayers. As a church, we have seen God and his effectiveness in listening and answering prayers. He doesn't have to, but he does. And some people will tell us this, especially those who are are going into false uh, religion. He doesn't listen to every prayer, but we can say, but he listens to ours. We have proof. We have recorded answers. He listens to prayers here at First Christian Church, Murfreesboro, Arkansas. And so we want you to know that in these devotions, you know, part of this has to do with also being devoted to one another. We are devoted to God And to one another. That's what Jesus said. All the law and the prophets hinges on these two. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. And I want to let you know today it's okay to walk into this place and not be okay. It's okay to be a mess in church. What did Jesus say to the Pharisees when they uh, saw him hanging out with all sorts of riffraff? Who needs the healthy? Or, Or who needs a doctor? The healthy or the sick? It's okay to be sick because we know the healer and we can introduce you to him today. We're glad you're here this morning. And as we get ready to do our word, I just want you to know that if you need anything, it goes even beyond Sunday morning service. We're here throughout the week. The elders and the deacons and myself were available to you. We want to see you grow spiritually. We want to see your, uh, you find fulfillment in Christ. And we want you to go where we're going and that's to meet Jesus Christ. So let's stand and read our scripture today, and we will pray. Jude 1, 20 to 21. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Before we uh, pray, are there any seniors here this morning? Any who've graduated? Lauren, are you the only one today? Well, come. I've got something. I don't want to pull you forward in front of everybody, but we're going to say a special prayer for our seniors, and uh, we have something for you. Um, but I don't. I, I don't want you to have to be the only one standing up. So, Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for another day. We are so unworthy, Lord, and yet you look upon us and love us. Your word tells us that while we were your enemies, you sent your son to die for the ungodly. God, we owe you everything. Lord, please help us to submit our hearts completely and utterly to you. To submit our thoughts and our actions completely and utterly to you. That our lives may be shaped and conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray today that our our worship, that everything we do, would just bring you honor and glory. We pray today, Lord, for uh, the kids as they go into their class. We pray, Father, for these seniors who've graduated. Father, I just pray protection over them. 
I pray, Lord, that as they go out into the world, Lord, you would keep your hand upon them. We thank you for them, Lord. And I just pray that we as your church would continue to be devoted to them as they grow and as they thrive and as they prosper. Father, we lift up all these things for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' almighty name, amen. Seven, great is thy faithfulness.
Let's sing before the throne of God above. As some of you may know, my wife Kirby and I had to go through IVF in order to have a child. If you don't know what IVF is, it stands for in vitro fertilization. It is a series of procedures used to help with fertility or prevent genetic problems and assist with the conception of a child. With me having diabetes and Kirby having ulcerative colitis or health issues, it made our chances having children slim to none. So we started the IVF journey. In 2018, we started going to Little Rock to the infertility doctors in hope of becoming parents one day soon. At the time, we had no idea how stressful, exhausting, hormonal for Kirby, scared, nervous, impatient, and heartbroken we would be during this process. The first retrieval they did on her, we were able to get six eggs, and only three were able to be used, which is normal. So after all the medicine and everything else involved to get Kirby's body ready, we tried egg number one. We were beside ourselves thinking in a short time we could finally say we were pregnant. Well, that wasn't the case. Number one didn't take. So we re repeated the steps. Number two and number three didn't take as well. To say we were heartbroken is an understatement. What we had longed for since we got married just seemed like it wasn't going to happen. We were mentally exhausted. We knew it wasn't a 100% guarantee with IVF that we would successfully get pregnant. So we decided to wait. The process of everything took its toll and Kirby wasn't sure if she wanted to put her body through it again. But with prayer and a lot of discussion, we decided to do another retrieval. 
This time they were able to retrieve six eggs again, and four of them were good. So we got ready to repeat the process and tried egg number one. On December 23rd, 2021, Hattie May Posey was born weighing six pounds and 15 ounces and being 20 inches long. And the coolest thing about that, she was, her egg was actually implant, implanted on Easter Sunday. Although we now, we now have our own child, those other embryos will be in our hearts forever. With all that being said, the other night while Kirby was heading home from work, me playing Mr. Mom, watching our daughter as she was being sweet and loving, it was like something just hit me. My world just stopped. This beautiful little girl is mine, and all I could say or think of to say was, thank you, God. I am one blessed man. Jesus came to this world to be a living example to people who are heartbroken, sick, scared, and sinful like me. Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28, and 29, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. How can we even begin to understand the amount of love that he has for us when he himself was hung on the cross for our sins? We don't deserve a love like that, but he did it anyways. Like the song says, he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set them free, but he died alone for you and me. At the Last Supper in Matthew 26, verse 26, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. As we get ready to take these emblems, let us remember his love and ultimate sacrifice he made for us sinful people. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we just thank you for, for this day, Lord, where we can meet around your house and worship you, Lord. Just thank you for that un unconditional love that you have for us, Lord, that uh, will never give up on us and just and keep loving us. Lord, as we come to this time in our service, we pray that uh, these emblems will uh, be represented when we take them, Lord, and we'll be taking them in a manner that will be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verse 22, it tells us, as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. <clears throat> and he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And as the Apostle Paul tells us, whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. All God's people said, <clears throat> Guy gets second place in a preacher boy tournament. He already runs the show. <laughs> How's everybody doing this morning? Good? <clears throat> so, who here likes taking tests? Like, seriously, anybody here like taking tests? There is literally no one on the front pew. Just let it the record stand that likes taking tests. What kind of tests? You like no, do you like taking tests? General question. Because we're just going to get into like, do I like quizzes online? No, we're not doing that stuff. Do you like, so no one likes taking, so who doesn't like taking tests? Okay. Everyone in the front, teachers are raising their hands enthusiastically at this. Oh, they help you get smart. Okay, okay. I like tests because they help me get smart. Okay. Now, I want you all to think about this. What kind of questions do you usually see on tests? Math, science, language. Okay, so let's break it down even further. When your teacher gives you a test, there's usually something where you have to write that's called a short answer, right? Or you have... Multiple answers, it's, kind of, it's called a what? Multiple choice. What other kind of questions can you be asked? Reading. You said trick questions? That's debatable and I think depends on who's, who's. True or false? That's what I want to talk about. True or false? Now, here's the thing I want you to think about. True or false questions can only have... A true answer or a false answer, right? Some people will be lawyers about it and try and argue with the teacher. Well, that's just not how I see it. And I've known some people in my life who will argue almost about everything. There's video proof of it. What's up? Just raising your hand? Yes, Bash. False means it's not true. So I want you to think about this because right now in the world in which we live in, there are people who are telling us that there's no such thing as true. They're saying that, for example, when you walk outside and it's a sunny day, what color does the sky look like? Blue. But there's some people saying, well, I believe it's the color green because I like green and because I think it's green, it must be green. Does that make the statement any more true? They could see blue, but they just like green, so they want it to be green. There's people out there who say, well, I don't like being human, so I want to be a parakeet. Does that make them any less human? So what we as believers in Jesus need to do is make sure that when something is true, we say it's true. And when something's not true, we say it's false. We need to stand on the truth. The Bible tells us that all the time. It says, if anyone thinks he's strong, watch out. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for a soul to devour. And if we are not careful, we can get sucked into something untrue. And so, where can we get our truth from? What can hold us accountable and keep us in the truth? God, sure, the Bible. So, today, you're going to go do a Bible lesson. I think there's lions involved with it. That actually I didn't really plan. I just thought of it when I looked at Miss Becky because she's grinning ear to ear. 
So I want you to think about that. Is there is an absolute true. And God tells us what is true and to hold on to the truth. Okay? Y'all hold on to the truth for me? All right, if you're in second grade, second grade and lower, y'all stand up and y'all go ahead and go to class. Have fun. Everybody else, you can stay in the front pew if you want. But you can go back to your parents. I'm, I'm going to say if your parents want you to go with them, I am not responsible at this point because I told you to go back. When he was being cross-examined <clears throat> for the final time, Jesus was asked by Pontius Pilate, what is truth? Anybody remember that scene from the scriptures? And I would argue that since Satan deceived Adam and Eve, we have been trying to debate that very same thing because really what it all boils down to is as my children like to interpret my instructions, they do. They'll take what I say and pick it apart to make it suit their advantage. Any other parents feel me on that one? Because I don't know how clean your room turns into play in your room for four hours and get even more stuff out. But we're in our room. But our nature is to question the authority of God because when we are in rebellion against him, affirming his truth destroys our narrative. We have been questioning truth since the very beginning. I think of <clears throat> Cain. Well, actually, let's just even go back. God looked at Adam when they had fallen and said, what have you done? Immediately, Adam said, Lord, I was in error. I made a mistake. Isn't that what happened? No. Adam tried blaming God. This woman you gave me gave me the fruit and I ate it. And then Eve, of course, she took all the full responsibility, right? No, she said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. It's always someone else's fault when we make the mistakes. Let's go down a generation to their two oldest boys, Cain and Abel. Abel gave his best. Cain didn't. God accepted Abel's sacrifice and he rejected Cain's. And God, I thought, was really reasonable with Cain. He tried reasoning with him. Cain, if you would just do what is right, but be careful because sin is creeping at your door and you must master it. And instead of mastering his sin, he overpowered his brother and killed him. And here we are, however many generations later it is, and we're still trying to overpower one another and not mastering our sin. Here is how you master sin. You take responsibility for it and you give it to the one who can handle it. There is only one truth, y'all. There aren't many truths. There are whole places that call themselves churches, but I refuse to acknowledge them as such. That'll tell you, you believe whatever you want, we're all going to the same place. But let's just think about this outside of the church. If we were to gather a room full of however many political parties there are nowadays, would everybody be agreeing on the same things? Absolutely not. You get a whole bunch of people who like certain movies together. I mean, go to a sci-fi convention sometimes, folks, and you'll see all the differences of opinions. You can't get people to agree on the same thing. Because we like to really take taste and hold it higher than truth. For example, Star Wars is better than Star Trek. I'm just saying. Stupid jokes, folks, but this is it. But the fact remains, and this is what we need to talk about, y'all. There is one truth. I just gave you an opinion. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, if God designed you and made you, he doesn't make a mistake, so you don't get to go to the complaint department. God sets aside what he desires his creation to be. He lets us know. He tells us specifically. 
so we don't get to argue with that. As a matter of fact, people have been pondering the meaning of life, but I'm going to tell you, if you open up the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, Genesis 127 and 128, give us indeed our purpose. Let's take a look at this. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Do you understand that our purpose in life is twofold? First, to bear the image of God. And to bear the image of God, we have to be like God. But secondly, to fill the earth with godly offspring. So whether we are, just as Taylor was saying this morning, we didn't plan it this way. Whether we are procreating, our job is to raise up godly young men and women to come after us. Or whether we are evangelizing, our job is to seek and find the lost and raise them up to bear once again the image they were created to be. Our purpose in life is to give God glory by bearing his image and multiplying that image. But what did we do? We turned it into something else. In the beginning, do you understand that God walked with Adam and Eve face to face? So much so that they knew what the sound of him walking in the garden in the cool of the day was like. I wish I knew what that was like. But they were deceived. And what were they deceived by? The serpent didn't go to the husband. He went to the wife. And he promised her that she would be like what she already was. If you eat of this fruit, you will not surely die, but you'll become like God. He made sin seem like a noble endeavor. You owe it to yourself to disobey your creator. Because he knows. He understands that if you eat this fruit, you'll be just like him. And what a great deception it was. Because their eyes were open, and all they knew was that they were naked. I'd want my money back. Loved ones, we've got to understand this. There is but one truth. And every time we deviate from that one truth, we keep deceiving ourselves more and more and more. And when we don't stand on the truth, we allow ourselves to be deceived. So today, the encouragement. And this verse isn't up on the screen, but let's stand and I'm going to read from the letter of Jude. And Jude, verse 5, says this. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah, the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people, also relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce the blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. And all God's people said, please be seated. Why are we talking about this? Because it was important to Paul, and it was important to Jesus, 
and it was important to Peter, and it was important to God throughout the Old Testament. And I can give you example after example that we talk about falsehood. Paul's biggest contention in the church at Corinth, Paul's biggest contention at the church at Galatia, God's biggest contention in the book of Revelation when Jesus revealed his letters to the churches was that people had forgotten what they were taught. They either subtracted from the Bible by taking away from the resurrection of the dead, which is the part of the gospel message, just as much as the removal of sin. Because without the resurrection of the dead, Jesus didn't rise from the dead, and we have a hope in nothing. Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 15. Or they tried adding to it, like in the church of Galatia, saying that in order to be a follower of Jesus, you also must be circumcised and follow such and such a rule. I don't want to know what kind of baptism that would have been like. Welcome to the family, brother. Go see the guy with the knife. My goodness. But we do it all the time, don't we? We add and we remove things from the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is central to everything we do. And here's the fact. You and I are rebellious against our creator. That's called sin. We do things willfully. We don't do things willfully. And because of our rebellious nature, sometimes we do things without realizing it. But anything that's a deviation away from our Father's design for us is sin. Which is why God sent Moses to come to Egypt and free his people. Because he wanted to establish a nation of priests that would go to the whole world to show them what he was like. He created laws. And those of you who don't like reading Deuteronomy, I would suggest that you take a deep dive into it and see that God really, all he was trying to do was live among his people. If you look at how the tabernacle was designed, it was designed with images of gardens and trees bearing fruit, hearkening back to the original blessing when God walked with Adam and Eve. If you look at how the temple was fashioned, it was fashioned with fruit trees and images of seraphim and angels and all sorts of things to hearken us back to the time when God walked with humanity, but in our sinful state, God cannot be with us. Not because of anything he's done, but because by our sin nature, to be in the presence of God would destroy us. And so God established what the truth was. God laid it down by Moses and by the prophets. God established it, confirmed it, And fulfilled it through his son Jesus Christ. And God gave us how to walk by it through his apostles. Why do we keep trying to reinvent it? There is one truth. And Jesus Christ established this when he was asked at the supper table, what is truth? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. If you want truth, church, Look no further than Jesus Christ because that's the only source of it. Far too often we have allowed ourselves to be controlled and deceived by well-intentioned people. But it's time we stand firm and take the truth back. Beloved, I want to tell you, for generations, Christians have stood firm and died upon this very principle that Jesus Christ is the only way. He is the only truth, and he is the only life. We've got to stop wondering what people will think of us on social media. We've got to stop worrying about being canceled because you can't cancel Christ. Because Jesus told this to Peter, surely you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's stand upon the truth. We're not called to fight for it. I love how Charles Spurgeon put it. The truth of the gospel is like a caged lion. You don't have to defend the lion. You just have to open the cage. We stand firm. He fights the battles. Stand upon the truth. And Paul 
called them out. I'm going to tell you all, I know this might be one of those hurt feelings kind of sermons, but I've got to tell you, we're supposed to call out falsehood. We're supposed to say what is wrong. We're supposed to point it out to one another and raise one another up. How can the light dwell anywhere with darkness? And so as Paul did, I want to encourage you to be bold and standing firm because there is only one gospel. Paul says this in Romans chapter 11, verse 1. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. I love how he writes this. This is a personal letter. He's writing it as a conversation because he wants them to understand that this isn't just merely an instruction letter. This is personal. He wants them to hear his voice in it. He has a relationship. He was the first person to preach in Corinth. And I'm running out of batteries. Now listen to this. He says, for I feel a divine jealousy for you. Since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Do we understand what he's saying here? Church, our responsibility to Christ once we have been saved is to be pure and holy and blameless before him. And too many of us, we have this tendency to get dunked underwater and say, I'm good. But why is it that Jesus warns us against false prophets? Why is it that it's written, if any of you thinks he is strong, watch out. Why is it we are written, or is it, is it written to work out your own faith among you with fear and trembling? Because deceivers will come. And they will come and they will try and draw you in and they will give you just enough truth to be plausible. And if you don't know what this says, you might get sucked into it. For example, some people think that this is a proverb. God helps those. Finish it for me, somebody. Who helps themselves. Find me that in Scripture. Matter of fact, in the chapter we're going to read next week, Paul actually says, when I am weakest, then I am strong. It says in Proverbs 3, do not lean on your own understanding. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Benjamin Franklin said that one, y'all. What about this? God will never give you any more than you can handle. That one makes me sick to my stomach. Paul actually writes at the beginning of this letter, we were so so much in anguish that we despaired of life. Does that sound like someone who could handle it? He said, but no, we trusted in the one who raises the dead. Loved ones, we've got to understand that if we do not put our entire faith and hope and trust in Christ and his word, we will be led astray. It's why the TV preachers are still getting rich. It's why there's so many churches out there who celebrate self. And now this big trend coming on in deconstructing your faith. And all these people who are making these social media videos trying to deceive young people because they know they've got a short attention span because they keep making the videos shorter and shorter, but they're having all these deep theological lessons that are completely untrue, but it sounds plausible because the person calls themselves reverend. We've got to understand That we are called to be pure and holy. And the only way we can measure ourselves by any of it is knowing who Jesus is. And the only way we can know Jesus is by looking at him through the scriptures. Yes, the Holy Spirit will reveal things to us. But God told me we'll never contradict the Bible says, y'all. Our job, our role as believers is to be presented as a pure virgin. If you notice that these images in in the end of Scripture point towards a marriage. 
But if the bride's not ready for her wedding gown, will there be a marriage? He says this, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Do you hear that he's afraid that they could, these believers, be led astray? How? For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. And here's the fact. You go to every church in this county, and you're going to hear a different version. A lot of people don't even know what the gospel is anymore. It's more about what I learned in church. But quite frankly, the gospel is simple. All of us have two problems. We're sinners. And because we're sinners, we are destined and doomed to die. But God, at the fullness of time, sent his son Jesus Christ to live as one of us. He was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect life in the flesh, fully God and yet fully human. I don't know how that works quite possibly, but I know it did. He lived a perfect life, completely obedient to God, the life that you and I in our rebelliousness can't. And they nailed him to a tree for it. But the Old Testament also says the penalty for sin is death. So Christ, upon the cross, nailed our sin to the cross. So that the promises of God in the Old Testament could be fulfilled where God says, I will remember their sins no more. Jesus Christ, upon that ugly, ragged, bloody cross, bore the wrath of God for those who believe. And he died. For three days he was buried, but he rose on the third day, proving that the consequence of sin no longer has any merit. Because he rose again, someday we too shall rise again in him. And the awesome part, you can live the resurrection life now, and in the time to come be glorified in his presence. Someday he's coming back. And he will set all things right. And then it will be too late to call upon his name. So you get in on this good news by following Jesus and being born again. That's the gospel. Who here has forgotten that? I'm going to tell you, there's times I have. Because I've been more concerned with church attendance. Or I've been more concerned with who likes me. Or I've been more concerned on what I think people need to hear. This is why I preach chapter and verse every single week. Because I can't contradict what the Bible says. And I'm going to tell you, test me against this. If I am in error, test me against this. Test everything against it. Why? Because the Bible says we can. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That by testing. You may know what the will of God is. What is good and pleasing and perfect. This is it, church. And yes, I'm going to tell you, sometimes it's hard to understand. But I couldn't understand my kids when they were first learning to talk. They had to learn to communicate clearly. They didn't come out knowing how to walk. That would have been awkward for all of us. They had to learn to act and be, to feed themselves. To stand, it is the same way in the spiritual journey. When we're born again, we're born as spiritual babies. And we have to learn the truth. And in Romans 10, 17, it says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. So the more we hear the word of Christ, we will grow. Our faith will blossom. We won't be deceived. But there are preachers out there who write books called The Power of I Am. And the great I Am is not really mentioned. Just as in Paul's day, and we're going to look at what he's saying here, there are preachers who are saying the gospel is all about you. No, it's not. It's all about Jesus Christ. There are preachers out there who are trying to teach a different Jesus, to teach a different gospel, to teach a different thing. And I'm going to say, stop calling yourselves the church because if it doesn't line up with the word of God, it's not the church. We need to be wary. We need to watch out. 
Because the Satan is exactly what the scripture calls him. He's a roaring lion and he's looking to drag you down with him. He knows his days are numbered. He knows his times are up. But just like some people who get into a fight, if I'm going down, they're going down with me. Don't let yourself get caught up in it. Stand firm. Know the truth. Hear the word of God and implement it throughout your life. And you know what's great? God understands our weaknesses. He understands that we're creatures of the flesh. But I'm going to tell you this. Part of that false gospel is also this, is excusing our weakness. The only time I bring up my weakness is to understand that I have a great need for a Savior. Charles Spurgeon, I, I know I quoted him a lot, but it's awesome. He says, I have a great sin, but I have a great Savior for my sin. Loved ones, we need to understand that anything apart from the deviation of God's word is sin. But we have a Savior who conquered it, and we need to keep preaching it. Yes, it's unpopular. It's unpopular to talk about sin. Why? Because, because in the age of social media, everyone only wants to be affirmed. Everyone only wants to be affirmed in the roles that they're in. I believe this about myself. So you, therefore, must accept me as I am. If I walked into your house and said, I believe that every dime you have in this place is mine, would you affirm my decision? Why would we allow this to continue going on? We need to stand firm upon the word of God and what he established cannot be undone in spite of our best efforts. And Paul will say this, Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. We've been talking about them. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. There are some people out there who are greater speakers and theologians than I am. But you know what? As long as I'm preaching the word of God and as long as I'm standing firm on it, and I'm going to tell you this, and I need you to hear this because this applies to y'all as well, if my life affirms that I'm following this, then I'm where I need to be. I don't need to compare myself to great theologians like John MacArthur and, and all these other men that I do have respect for. And I don't need to compare myself. I heard one preacher put it this way. He goes, I didn't like listening to Jimmy Swaggart, but you know, he's, he's a Church of Christ preacher. He goes, but I loved be, him being able to be expressive, so I turned him down all the way just so I can watch him move. I may not be as talented an orator as some of these TV preachers are. But I will stand upon the word of God, even if it means I'm never wealthy or popular. Even if it means that my whole life is completely sold out to Jesus Christ and I die crucified upside down on a cross or beheaded or stabbed through the heart with a spear. If it puts me in prison, if it makes me unpopular, if my pulpit is reduced to standing on a street street corner and, they, corner and they staple my lips shut so it has to leak out my ears. I'm going to stand firm and preach the gospel of Christ till my very last breath is done. And I'm charging you today, church, to do the same. You may not be a preacher behind a pulpit, but if you call yourself a follower of Christ, you are being watched. And your sermons, also known as your life, may give approval to people saying, well, if that's how Christians are, I don't need to change. We are called to be pure and blameless and holy before a pure and blameless and holy God. So let the Holy Spirit do his work. But Paul also wanted to charge the church in Corinth, and he still to this day charges us to know the difference between truth and falsehood. Listen to what he says here in verse 7. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted. Because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge. These super apostles, and I'm going to say it again, they walked in and they said, if you give us your love gift, <laughs> look at how popular I am. I speak well. I look fabulous. I wear the nicest clothes. I have money. And look at this bald guy with the lisp. That's how Paul described himself. 
He's always in and out of prison. I'm never in trouble. He's always stirring up strife wherever he goes. We don't cause any problem. Who is the true teacher? I'm going to tell you something. If you're not living a life for Christ, your life will never stir up any trouble. Because Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Not you may, not you might, not it's possible, you will. If you are living for Christ, there will be trouble. And I'm not talking about the kind you cause for yourself. Because I know some people who want to come in and cause problems everywhere they go and then say, I'm just being persecuted. I had a long talk with another preacher, and that happened at his church in Kansas. This lady comes in and says, well, why can't I be in this office that's established in the Word? And they explained it to her, and they said, we will find a ministry for you. And she came out saying, they said they'll put me in my place. That's not persecution. Loved ones, we need to understand that if we make a stand upon the Word of God while we're called To live a quiet life, that's our conduct, will stir up strife and turmoil. They nailed our Lord and Savior to a cross. Why do we, his followers, expect less? You know that something is the truth when people are constantly trying to shut it up. When they're constantly trying to censor it and control it. Why? Why do... Governments and and why do uh, uh, empires and why do kings and why do religious factions hate Christianity? I've got a friend who's a a Muslim in a foreign country, and I won't say which because this is being recorded. But I was told by this person that any time they dared to question Islam, they were called a free thinker and shut up and humiliated. This is why Romans threw Christians to lions. Not because Christians were rebellious. No, Christians were some of the best citizens of the empire. They are some of the most faithful citizens of the empire. But when you refuse to worship Caesar and you have a different message than that, Caesar will retaliate. The world doesn't hate us because we're not good people. The world hates us because we are light and they are dwelling in darkness. And what is in darkness cannot stand the light. Be light anyway. Paul continues. He says, I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. Be careful of somebody who's always asking you for money. Not that it's wrong to ask. But if you see how they live and they're constantly telling you to send them their love gift and you'll get a blessing, I wonder what they're selling. I remember when I first came back to Christ, I was too embarrassed to go back to my home church. I'm not sure if anyone can ever relate to that, but that's my story. And so I began going to this church, and and for a long time I was fed there, and I met a group of people who I loved passionately, until one day when God told me it was time to go. This lady gets up on the stage, and she begins to, to what she called prophesy. And I know the Spirit of God is on because, I, I mean, y'all will feel that goose flesh happen. You feel his presence. You know what it is. This was the opposite. It felt like I was being pricked by a thousand needles. And then everybody in this church, or in my little group, we got together, and it was like a veil was torn from my eyes because they said, what are you believing for this month? I said, what do you mean? I'm believing to get to Jesus. They said, no, no, no. You know, my car broke down, so I'm believing for a new one. I said, where's that in the Scripture? I read my Bible every day and I've never come across that verse. Believe for something. He said, well, no, 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 you don't understand. A faith healer was here and, and brother over here was on the stage and, and he made him move around like a puppet. I said, where did Jesus ever put on a show like that? They said, you don't understand. They were over there selling healing oil. I said, where do they ever sell anything like that in the scriptures? 
They said, you don't understand. I bought a, 20, or I bought a crucifix and I wrapped a $20 bill around it and I've never been without money. I said, because you always have $20. Do you understand that these charlatans are infiltrating everywhere? They're out to make money for themselves. They're not out to produce works for the kingdom or fruit for the kingdom. They're out to get for themselves. And they're looking for a sucker. Loved ones, we got to understand that if we are not on our guard, we will be taken in easily. And that night, God broke fellowship with me with those people because I was done there. I didn't need to be around it. And by the way, all my fears of going to my home church were completely unfounded. They were just glad I came home. But Paul is warning us that those who are looking to line their own pockets, who are constantly showing you, oh, well, you know, you don't know what the need for the ministry is. God just burdened me to get a jumbo jet. God burdened me because every time I pray on the plane, it makes everyone uncomfortable. Make everyone uncomfortable and pray on the plane. If you're really of God, you'll draw people to him. You don't need a jumbo jet. Y'all remember that time when, you know, Jesus went and bought a a chariot and uh, solid gold hubcats, you know, like those big old 60-inch rims they used to have and and how tricked out it was. Y'all remember that, right? Neither do I. But we have preachers who are more concerned with wearing $5,000 shoes when there's somebody who doesn't even make that in three months in their congregation. Jesus said, you'll know a tree by its fruits. I'm not trying to make a, a, a sermon about envy here. But if you want to know if someone's following Christ or not, compare them to Christ and not to what the worldly standards are. This is our responsibility Not just merely mine behind the pulpit. Yes, me and the elders are shepherds trying to protect against the wolves. But hopefully, y'all who are in the flock are also getting wise. Paul says this. Verse 10. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why not? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. When you say the truth, it will hurt. It'll hurt. Paul didn't just write two letters to the Corinthians. He wrote three. And the visit before this letter was called the painful visit because Paul had to say some unreally pop, or unpopular truths. He had to say things that hurt people's feelings. But I'm going to tell you something. If you come to church and you're offended for all the right reasons, that's what inspires change. If I wasn't offended, I wouldn't change at all. But the Holy Spirit is every single day through the Word of God troubling my spirit so that it will be aligned and in tune with the God of all the universe. And God didn't call us to sit in comfort. I'm actually pretty grateful that our AC units aren't working the way they're supposed to right now. It's a good illustration. God didn't call us to say, well, you know, that church has a color carpet that I don't particularly like, so they must not be in line with the Word of God. Or, I know what the Bible says about how a church should be run. By the way, there's not a book about how a church should run in its service. It just says maintain orderly service. We develop traditions and opinions and things that are far from what the truth are, but we need to speak the truth, and it will hurt. But we do so for the simple fact that God restored us by the truth. I don't know about y'all, but every time I read the Bible, I get my feelings hurt. I do. I get my feelings hurt because I'm not aligned with God. Not completely. And here's the thing. I'm not going to be aligned with God completely till I get to heaven, but I don't want the excuse that I'm imperfect to continue on in my sin. I'm not going to. Every single day, my breath and my thoughts and my actions are slowly being conformed in a way that God knows I can handle. And so when my feelings get hurt, I'm going to praise God because I know he's still working on me. And if I ever open up these words and I'm not offended by them and I don't change by them and and all those things, I wonder what side of the veil I'm on or that my heart needs to change. 
Paul says this in verse 12, and what am I doing or what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no purpose if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Understand this, that God's not calling us to fill pews on a Sunday morning. He's calling us to go and proclaim the gospel that he may change hearts. And if someone walks in saying, you know... If you would just compromise just a little bit, more people would come. But that's not the way the world works, really. A little bit of compromise. Because when you allow a little bit of compromise to come in, the world takes and takes and takes and takes and takes and will never give back. Stand firm. Stand upon the truth. Stand upon the word of God, even if you must do so by yourself. And with Christ, you're never alone. I told this story a few weeks ago, but I think it bears repeating. A woman in around the, the 200, I think it was around 230 AD, was caught as a Christian and fed to the lions in a Roman Colosseum. During one of the passes of the beasts, her veil was knocked off the top of her head, her little head covering. She asked Caesar to pause the game for just a minute. Not like we have in our video games today, but to hold the lions back. Why? So she could tie her hair back. Because in their culture, to keep your head down, your hair down was a sign of mourning. She wanted to show the world her joy that she was going to meet her Jesus. It doesn't matter what we're facing, church. If we stand upon the truth, Christ will give us the opportunity. And though she has been dead 1,800 some odd years, her story still speaks to Christians today. And Paul says this, their end will correspond to their deeds. Here's something you also have to worry about. You're not put on this earth to fix the problem. You can't. But our God is a God of justice. What does it say in in Romans chapter 12? Paul reminds us, he says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, for it is written. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Instead, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so, church, what do we do? We're not told to fight the battle. We're supposed to boast in weakness then. Here's what I mean. And we'll get into a little, this a little more next week. Verse 16, Paul writes, I repeat, let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, accept me as a fool so that I too may boast a little. What I am saying with this boastful confidence, I say not as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many boast according to flesh, I too will boast. For you'll gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. He's like, all right, you're bearing with these fools. Let me be foolish for a minute. For you bear if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we're too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I'm speaking as a fool. By the way, that's what the super apostles were saying of him. So he's using that language to his advantage. I also dare to boast in that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. You hear that little sarcasm in there? I love it. We need to stand up against false teachers and do so in a way that draws attention to their foolishness. So he says this, I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death, five times at the hands of the Jews, the 40 lashes less one, three times I was beaten with rods, 
Once I was stoned. By the way, church, that means they threw rocks with him, so don't take liberties with this verse. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day, I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil, hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. I love it. Paul says, let me boast. Look at what I can boast in. Look at these things I can say I accomplished. Doesn't sound like something you want to brag about, does it? But I think he's echoing Philippians 4, 13, where he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He also says this in verse 28. And apart from other things, there is daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak? And I'm not weak. Who is made to fall? And I'm not indignant. It's been said, church, that sometimes the loneliest person in the church is not the person who walks in on Saturday morning disheveled and in despair. It's the preacher who anguishes over the church and stays up late at night and can't talk to his wife about the things he labors over. And I'm not saying this to gain sympathy. I just want you to know that just like in the movie The Patriot, the shepherd must tend to flock and at times fight off the wolves. I labor on my knees for you daily. I'm not good at making phone calls when I want to. I'm not good at visiting when I want to. But I'll die for you. And I'll sacrifice myself again and again on the altar of the cross of Christ, that you may know and see the glories of God. So if we must boast, church, let's boast in weakness. Let's not boast in any of our accomplishments. Let's not boast that we have nice cars or nice houses or nice things. Let's boast in the sufferings we have for Christ. Let's have joy in them. When Peter and John were taken and beaten and told not to preach the gospel, they left praising God. Why? Because to suffer alongside Christ makes us more worthy of him. Because we are being like him and we are giving all for him. Loved ones, beware of people who want to tell you their qualifications. Because when we stand before Christ Jesus, not a single one of us is qualified. But instead, let us seek to be pure and holy before a holy and pure God. But Paul's not done in his boasting. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he who is blessed forever, knows that I'm not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. Loved ones, we've got to understand something here. When we come to Christ, it's not promised us that we're going to have a crystal stair all the way to heaven. It says the path is straight and narrow, but those who like going hiking know that straight and narrow paths often are rocky, steep, And hard to climb. I remember uh, when I was a lot younger, I would go off and hiking up in the mountains over my home near San Bernardino. And and at times I would be on a thin, narrow path. And down below me would be about a thousand foot drop. And if I missed one step, I could be dead. That's the straight and narrow path we're called to take. It says in Psalm 119, verse 105, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That sounds ridiculous until you understand what it means. God doesn't want us to see too far ahead. He wants us to take one single step at a time in Him. God desires us to be so grounded in His word that the moment we hear a falsehood, we would know it. God desires us to be like himself so that when we see unholiness, we cannot abide its presence. Not the people, mind you, but the spiritual forces behind it. God wants us to be creatures of spirit. He wants us to raise up and fill the earth with such creatures, raising our own children and those disciples who come after us. 
But you're not going to lead anybody if you're not willing to stand up for what's true. And believers, he's not talking to the preachers and elders. He's talking to the church in Corinth. You are called and chosen beloved of God. Make sure you stand on his word. Let's not get tired. Let's not grow weary. Let's not get lazy. And yes, it is exhausting. It's exhausting. And there's times I can echo what Paul said. I I just, I, I, I couldn't take it anymore. I despair of life at times. But I take my comfort in the God who raises the dead. I stand firm upon his truth. And I echo the words of Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for those who believe. So when I despair of life, I unleash the power of God by speaking the gospel. I want to stand upon it. I desire to live by it. I desire to be a husband in it. I desire to raise my children in it. I desire to be a neighbor in it. I desire to go to the grocery store in it. And y'all know what it's like in Walmart, especially these days, you need the Holy Spirit. But I'm not going to understand the will of God if I'm not in the Word of God. I'm not going to be able to discern times, dates, or seasons if I don't listen to what he says about them. And so I confirm to you that this word is true. Every bit of it. And I'm going to challenge you alongside me. And as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Endure trials and hardships. Stand firm. Speak boldly. Walk in Christ. I'm going to invite the elders to come forward as as Brother Randy prepares to lead us. But I also want to invite you. Maybe your walk hasn't been as good as it should be. Come lay it all down at the altar. I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's okay to not be okay. This is the place you should be able to run to and and feel healing because you feel sick in your spirit. This should be the place to be broken because Jesus is still in the business of putting lives back together. And if you feel dead inside, we know the one who raises to life. Church, let today be about Jesus. Give your life completely back to him. If you don't want prayer, there goes my water bottle. If you don't want prayer, come kneel. Come just give your life. If you don't feel like you, you, you want people, uh, people's eyes upon you, I ask brothers and sisters every single week, and they're there every single week, standing along the back waiting to pray for you. If you don't want to come because you're too embarrassed to talk at church, come talk to us. We're here seven days a week. If you don't want to come in because you don't want someone to see you, take one of my cards. It's got my cell phone on it. And almost everybody here who's called me knows I'm available almost every single day. And if I miss your call, I will call you back. There is no excuses. Get to Jesus however you can. Run to him. Cling to him. Be like that woman who was suffering for 12 years of her life and just knew she could just touch the hem of his, lo- of his robe. So she braved through the crowds knowing she was unclean, knowing what they would think of her, and she grabbed that hem because she knew he was the only one who could save her. Run to Christ. Know that you are forgiven in him. And only in him can you find forgiveness. So if you can't forgive yourself this morning, come, grab the hem of his robe. He will turn and confirm your faith. Get to Jesus, whatever it takes. Don't let another day go by. Don't let another minute go by. If you've never met Jesus, you know he's forgiven your sins. We've talked about that. When you come to him and believe in his name. There is always healing at the foot of the cross. There is neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor male nor female. The ground at the foot of the cross is even. But you're only going to find forgiveness in him. You're only going to find freedom and life in him. There is no other place and that is the truth I stand upon today. You can stand upon it too. Just get to Jesus. So as we sing this last song, I want to affirm you.
Thanks for putting up with me, speaking hard truths. When the message isn't encouraging. But I'm going to tell you the truth because I want you to go where I'm going. I'm going to tell you the truth because there is no other except through Christ Jesus. I'm going to tell you the truth that you may go out and carry the truth out into a world that needs to hear it. Go carry the truth. Let's stand. The announcements as follows. Friday benefit will be for Jacob Teal. Expenses will be at uh, branches or the old Deaton Oil down here. Be smoking. I mean, I'm sure cook, uh, cooking. And then something we need in this congregation is several of them, but uh, we need some youth camp volunteers. And that's over to Kamichi's at C. Bryan on that one. And that's three weeks of camp. You don't have to do it all in three weeks. No. Preacher, I only one that gets three weeks of vacation, okay? <laughs> I know. Uh, and then uh, we need some volunteers for the nursery, for toddlers, with, and twos, and for children's church. And uh, desperate need. Junior church will be non-existent in June, July, and August unless we have nobody. So, but anyway, any any more announcements? The graduates. All righty. Any questions? Anything? JJ, would you have a closing prayer, please?
Smith.